All right, if you have your Bibles, uh, our scripture lesson comes this morning from Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 to 24. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Draw out and take yourself a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to you and to your sons forever. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for your watch care over your people. And you have your people who are people that believe you and trust you. We thank you for this word and ask that you would add to our understanding of your word. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. About 3,500 years ago, a very strange event took place in Egypt. Egypt, a land where people worshipped gods of the dead. Gods with names like Isis, Horus, Osiris. These gods who really were false gods, fallen angels, uh, that started in Babylon with people like Nimrod and Semiramis. You know, um, I was looking on YouTube recently and I was watching uh, what happened in Brazil after they celebrated their Carnival, Carnival season. And um, you realize that in those parades they are um, actually worshiping Satan. In one part of that parade they showed um, Satan beating and killing Jesus and Jesus, the guy playing Jesus, doesn't get up. There's no resurrection. You know what happened in Brazil right after this the same areas that held the parades were flooded you know God is a very long suffering God but he doesn't put up with stuff forever and he didn't put up with Egypt having his people enslaved forever. Now 500 years probably felt, felt like forever but, uh, but he did get them out. But you know what's interesting is that Egypt uh, the Pharaoh had heard that there was going to be a deliverer and so Egypt slaughtered thousands of baby boy Jews because the occult priests told them 
one of them would be a savior to his people. And of course, this one that was, was named Moses. And um, Moses went out and told his people that God was about to deliver them. And by doing so, he was instituting an unusual celebration called Passover. And this is where the Jewish people were delivered by the power of the blood of a lamb which had been roasted in fire. You talk about symbolism, this is dripping with symbolism. It is full of symbolism. And the fact is, is God still teaches with symbols and stories and lessons in history to this day. The problem is people aren't listening. And it gets really bad when people in church don't listen. Well, preacher, why is Passover important to Christians? We, we aren't Jews. Well, you see, the Bible, the New Testament tells us that Christ is the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. You can find that in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29. And then at the end of the book of, uh, uh, of the New Testament, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, we have the elders in heaven worshiping the Lamb, which is Jesus. In verse 12 of chapter 5, they say, the Lamb is worthy. In verse 13, they say, he has the power to open the seals. He's powerful. The Lamb is powerful. In chapter 6, verse 16, we see that the Lamb has great wrath. In chapter 7, his, uh, he's seated upon a throne. And in verse 14 of chapter 7, his blood cleanses us from sin. In chapter 12, we see uh, where the people are saying we overcome sin and Satan and the world by his blood. In chapter 13, we see that the Lamb has a book of life. In chapter 15, he has a song to sing. In chapter 17, he is a warrior. And also in chapter 17, he will conquer all his enemies, not some. He will leave no stone unturned. In chapter 19, we see that the Lamb is engaged to be married and that the church is his bride. And if you're part of the church, there is a wedding to attend and you are going to be in it. So am I. And in chapter 21, the Lamb will be our light for all eternity. Why is this so? It's so because Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. In Revelation 13.8, say, it says that he was slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, this was God's plan. Before anybody had done anything, this was God's plan. He paid the price for our sins. In Romans chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, Paul writes, Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption of that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a mercy seat. That Greek word is hilasterion. He has been set forth to be a mercy seat through faith in his blood for a showing forth of his righteousness in respect of the passing by the sins that had taken place before. And now, I know that's a literal translation. It reads differently than the English. 
but basically what Paul is saying is that Jesus is a gift from God. He's being gracious to us. We don't deserve it, but we have redemption in the person of Christ on what he did on the cross for us. His sacrifice was perfect. And Jesus is a mercy seat. He's a place. And it's by faith in his blood what he did for us that his blood cleanses us from our sins. All of our sins. The sins that have passed by. In Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 we read you, and some people are asking this because I know there's some very famous preachers one in particular who I won't name uh, has a big church he's uh, reportedly an evangelical uh, I even have a set of his commentaries but he has said well uh, it's not the blood of Jesus that, uh, that uh, saves us it's, it's the fact that he died well yes it is the fact that he died but it is his blood. Preacher, what do you mean by that? Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh, it is in the blood. And God says, I have given it to you on the altar to atone for your souls, for it is the blood that atones for the soul. Let me repeat that. It is the blood that atones for the soul. I don't I I don't understand it. I understand some things about blood. The red color comes from the iron. The blood corpuscles have no nucleus in them. That they're produced in our bone marrow. There's a lot of scientific things that I understand about blood. I don't understand what the specific meaning of Leviticus 17 or what that passage in Hebrews means. All that I know is, is there is something about it that God requires. And he is the creator. And there's something he created there. And these preachers need to start wising up and stop trusting their PhDs and their doctor's degrees. Just as so long ago the children of Israel were promised that if they applied the blood to the door of the homes they would be freed from slavery and also that their firstborn wouldn't be killed. So too, today are people freed from the slavery of to sin when they apply Yeshua's, Jesus' blood to their heart and life. You know, we are also told that Christ is the bread from heaven. And when you say, well, what kind of bread? And we're talking about unleavened bread bread. Turn to gospel, the Gospel of John chapter 6. I'm going to skip through different verses here just for the sake of time. Starting in verse 35, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me in no wise may hunger. And he that believes on me in no wise may thirst at any time. So there's the bread that's providing hunger. And there's the blood that's taking care of your thirst. Then look at verse 40. And this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the Son and believes on him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Folks, that's who's going to raise you up is Jesus. 
if you're a believer. No, verse 44, no one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Then look at verse 47. Amen, amen, I say to you, he that believes on me has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the desert and died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down out of heaven. If anyone sh shall have eaten of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread also that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. There is also during Passover the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Look in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 4. Uh, these are appointed times of Jehovah, holy gatherings, which you shall proclaim in their fixed times. In the fourteenth day of the first month, the first month being Nisan, Nisan, in the fourteenth day of the first month between the evenings is the Passover to Jehovah. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to Jehovah. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Now, I want to point out something here. The word that's translated as feast comes from the Hebrew word moed which is more akin to the idea of an appointment. God has an appointment with you. I would prefer myself to keep the appointments that he has that are for my benefit. But every person is going to have an appointment with God one day. And those that aren't ready, that's an appointment you're not going to be looking forward to. During unleavened bread, the entire home must be searched for any trace of leaven. Leaven here represents sin. When Christ said that he is the bread of life, he was alluding to both the manna experience of the children of Israel when they were in the desert, and to communion, which would be instituted at the Last Supper, which is Passover. Now, why is this important, preacher? You know, you're, you're getting kind of technical. Well, Christ is without sin. He never sinned. He had no leaven. If he's the bread of life, he's the unleavened bread. And the stripes on the bread are his stripes where he was beaten by the soldiers. And the piercings of the bread are his piercings. You see, in our church, when we have communion, we, we use matzah. And matzah has stripes on it that are burned stripes. And it has holes in it that are piercings. And that's what matzah is. Now, one thought that came to me when I was working on this is Leviticus chapter 19 verse 28. And it's where God forbade people to have piercings or cuttings. Now remember, this was being applied to the house of Israel. And he was telling the people in Israel, don't do this. 
I was thinking that maybe that's because he wanted of all the house of Israel that would be in eternity, he only wanted his son to bear those marks to remind us, to remind the angels, to remind everybody what the price was that he paid, his stripes and his piercings. After the bread has been consumed and the lamb roasted and eaten, then the first fruit is offered by a priest as a wave offering before the Lord. I, I mentioned this once before, not too long ago in a sermon where I had been a chaplain at a prison and a, and a Jewish inmate had me doing the wave offering because he said I was the closest thing to a priest <laughs> that he could find. Leviticus chapter 23 verses 10 and 10 to 12 says, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I am giving to you and have reaped its harvest and have brought in the sheaf of the beginning of your harvest to the priest, then he shall wave the sheaf before Jehovah for your acceptance on the morrow of the Sabbath the priest shall wave it. In other words, the next day he shall wave it. <clears throat> and you shall prepare in the day you wave the sheaf of ram, a perfect one, a son of its year for a burnt offering to Jehovah. <clears throat> the day after the Sabbath of Passover is for us Resurrection Sunday. You know, there's another thing that's kind of interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that is, why did Jesus instruct Mary to stop clinging to him? John chapter 20, verse 17. After he was raised, Jesus says to her, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brother's and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. What was he doing? Well, he was offering himself as the first fruit and the lamb. He was both the sheaf of the first fruit of the resurrection. He was going to stand before the Father and he was the lamb that had been offered. He was both. Just like you do in Passover. Paul said something about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from among the dead. He became first fruit of those fallen asleep. For since by man is death, also by man, resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in the Christ, the Messiah, all shall be made alive. But each in his own rank, Christ the first fruit, then those of Christ at his parousia, at his appearing. Then the end when he shall have given up the kingdom to him who is God and Father, when he shall have annulled all rule and all authority and power. You see, the end of everything that we're going through right now, it's not for a long time yet. It's not for another thousand years plus whatever time that is. When at this, all of this is finally finished, and we will begin eternity with God. That's when there'll be no more sin. When all the enemies are put down and the last enemy is death, that's when everything gets turned over, back over to the Father. And he starts being controlling well, he's controlling everything now, but that's when everything is finally back to where it should be. 
Well, preacher, you mentioned something about Passover, and and you said that something about the destroyer. You you had to have the blood put on the lintel and doorposts so that God would keep the destroyer out of your home. Well, you know, one of my favorite quotes of the Lord comes from Isaiah 46. I tell the end from the beginning, that one. Look in verse 9 and 10. Remember former things on your heart, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and no none any more God. In other words, there, there aren't any other gods. Even none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from the past things that were not done saying my purpose shall rise and all my desire I will do um, God's the only one if you're worshiping some other God it might be an Elohim it might be a fallen angel but it's not Jehovah it's not I am it's not his son So go back to Exodus with this in thought about this destroyer. Look at the Passover command. You find it in verse 23 of Exodus 12. For Jehovah will pass on to smite Egypt. That's, that's what it literally says. And he will see the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts. Jehovah will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. Now what's interesting here is when you look at the Septuagint and you see this word destroyer, it's the same word that's used in 1 Corinthians 10.10. 10 that talks about a kind of serpent. Ah! Now do you know who the destroyer is? At the beginning of God's plan for redemption, God said he himself was the one who passed over looking for the blood at a particular spot on the door or we might say a portal because that's what the word portal means is door now one of my favorite songs is let Jesus come into your heart your heart is a portal it's a door and God's looking for that blood to be applied to your heart not your blood but his son's blood see God has designed a way that he can come into your heart and it's through the door of your heart but the blood has to be applied and of course some of our old songs talk about that too now you might be saying, Preacher, how can you tell if, if the blood has been applied to a heart? Well, it's kind of easy actually. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. He says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for from the fruit the tree is known. You see, Jesus is the first fruit. And if he is in your heart, you will also be bearing much fruit. But preacher, who or what is the destroyer? I'm. You seem to be kind of dancing around it. Well, the Hebrew word for destroyer is one who causes destruction, decay, and ruin. It's used in Jeremiah 51 referring to a mountain 
O destroying mountain Babylon. You see, there is a destroyer that's behind Babylon, and that's Satan. Satan's the destroyer. And the word Satan means enemy. Could it be that this destroyer is the one who is forbidden to kill men in Revelation 12 under the name Abaddon, which means to wander away, to perish? Could the mystery religion of Babylon be connected to a fallen angel? Weren't the gods of Egypt the same as Apollo? Apollyon? In Revelation? You know, in um, Acts chapter 16, verse 16, we see something about the oracle of Apollo, the Pythos. The Pythos. The Python. Isn't it interesting how these gods are connected with the serpent? Well, Resurrection Sunday is the day of first fruit. And that's coming up. <clears throat> is Jesus reigning in your heart? Because, you see, it appears that at the end of the age, People must make a choice. God and his son or the destroyer. How much better is it to have fruit than to have decay? To have the father's love rather than the enemy's hate. And with all the hate that's in the world today, that should be a pretty easy choice to make. At least it seems that way to me. Let's pray. Father, we do pray for those that have not made that choice for your son. We pray that they will before it is eternally too late. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.